video lesson is all about mathematical system. Before we proceed with our lesson proper, let's have the word jumbo. So we will try to figure out what is the word that you can form using the jumbled letters. Here, the word is line. Second one, the word that can we create and this one is action. For the third one, it is a point. Fourth one, angle. Fifth one, segment. Sixth one, plane. Seven, ray. Eight, it is postulate. Ninth, we have theorem. And then for the last one, we have measure. The first part of the mathematical system is all about the undefined terms. These are the terms that cannot be defined, but they have their characteristics and they can be described. The first undefined term is the point. This is the illustration of a point. It has no length and no width, meaning it has no dimensions. We can say that this point is point B. We will use a capital letter to denote a point. One real life example of point is a tip of the pen or pencil. The next undefined term is the line. This is an example of line. It has two headed arrow, meaning we can extend it infinitely. Line has no width and thickness, but it has length. There are two points in a line, so we have point B and C. This line is called line BC. The symbol has a line on the top of it. The other way of naming a line is using a small letter so this is a line M. An example of line is the edge of the page of the book. The third undefined term is the plane. It is a flat surface that extends infinitely in all directions. This plane is named as plane M. An example of plane is this notebook, the surface of this notebook. Now let's have the defined terms. These are the terms that have definition. The first one is the line segment. It is formed when two points or two distinct points are connected with a straight line. So it has two end points and it cannot be extended either to the left or to the right. So we will name this line segment as line segment AB or line segment DA. The second defined term is ray. Ray is a part of a line and it extends in one direction only. So from one end point, you can extend the ray using one-headed arrow. So we will name this ray as ray AB. The third one is the angle. Angle is formed by using two rays meeting at a common end point which is the vertex. So here is the common endpoint. So we can name this one as angle BOX or angle O using the vertex of the angle or if there is an available number inside the angle, we can name this one as angle 1. We also have some connected terms to the defined terms. The first one is all about the midpoint of the segment. When we say midpoint, it is the middle of the segment. It divides the segment into two congruent parts. For example, we have segment AB. 
The middle of segment AB is the midpoint N. So meaning AN is congruent to ND. If AN is 7, what do you think is the value of ND? It is also 7. If AB is 20, what is the value of AN? It is 10. That's how you apply the midpoint of the segment. Next, we have congruent angles. When we say congruent angles, angles have the same measure. In these figures, we have two right angles, meaning angle AXB is congruent to angle CYD because they are both right angles. Next, we have perpendicular lines. They are formed using two lines intersect at a right angle. So here, we form four right angles. So meaning, AC is perpendicular to BD. That is the symbol for perpendicular. Next, we have angle bisector. A ray that divides an angle into two congruent or equal parts. So if we have one angle, we will have a ray at the middle. So we have CY as the bisector of angle BCD. So meaning angle BCY is congruent to angle YCD. Next, we will have the properties of, the, of equality. The first one is the reflexive property. A number is equal to itself, that is A is equals to A. So here we have BX is congruent to BX because it is reflexive or the two angles share the same side which is BX. The second property is the symmetric property. If A is equals to B, then B is equals to A. Given these two angles, if angle ABC is congruent to angle DEF, then angle DEF is congruent to angle ABC. The third property is the transitive property. It means if A is equals to B and B is equals to C, then A is equals to C. So we, you will disregard the repeated term. So in this case, the repeated term is B. So we will have A is equals to C as the conclusion. Given that these three segments, we have if segment AB is congruent to segment CD and segment CD is congruent to segment EF, then segment AB is congruent to segment EF. So we disregard segment CD because it is repeated. Let's have postulates. Postulates are assumed to be true without any proof, meaning we are using these postulates but actually they are not yet proven. They are also called as action. Let's have the first postulate. There are two points contained in exactly one line. So in this line, it says there are two points. It is actually accepted or we are using this one but this is not yet proven. Postulate number two. A line contains infinitely many points. It means in one line, there are many points or there are a lot of points that lie on that line. Postulate number three. If two points of a line, so we have point BC in one line, lie in a, in a plane, then the line lies in the same plane. So meaning line BC also lies on the plane F. Postulate number four. Any three points lie in at least one plane and any three non-collinear points lie on that exactly one plane. When you say non-collinear points, these are the points that do not lie on the same line. So we have non-collinear points D, E, F and then they lie on the same plane which is the plane G. Let's have postulate number five. If two different planes intersect, their intersection is a line. So here we have plane G and plane E. Their intersection is line 
CD. That's a postulate number 6 or the angle measurement postulate. It means the, the measure of an angle is a real number between 0 degrees and 180 degrees. Simply, this angle, angle EFG, has the measurement of N degrees, where N degrees is between 0 degrees and 180 degrees. So it is higher than 0 degrees but less than 180 degrees. Every angle measures only up to 180 degrees. Let's say postulate 7 or the linear pair postulate. If two angles form a linear pair, then they are supplementary. When we say supplementary, the angles, if we add the angles, their sum is 180 degrees. For example, we have angle AYC, which is 100 degrees, and angle BYC, which is 80 degrees. Angle AYC and angle BYC are a linear pair, meaning they are supplementary. If we add the two angles, we need to get 180 degrees. The first angle is 100 degrees and then the second angle is 80 degrees. When we add them, we will get 180 degrees. Postulate number 8. Given a line and a point, not on the line. So we have a line and a point. There is exactly one line through the point parallel to the given line. So we will have a, a line through this point and then we will have line M is parallel to line N. Postulate number 9. If two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the corresponding angles are congruent. So we will have two lines, line M and N, and then a, a transversal which is line P. So in this scenario, we created eight angles. Now, we need to find the corresponding angles. When we say corresponding angles, these are the angles which are on the same side and on the same position. So, when we have angle 1, the corresponding angle for angle 1 is angle 5. And then for angle 2, the corresponding angle of 2 is angle 6. They are both on the right side and above the line. Next, when we have angle 3, the corresponding angle for angle 3 is angle 7. They are both on the right side and below the line. Last one, the corresponding angle of angle 4 is angle 8. So, angle 4 is congruent to angle 8. They are both on the left side below the line. Let's have theorems. Theorems are basic geometric principles which are proven deductively. So unlike the postulate, theorems are already proven. Let's have the first theorem. All right angles are congruent. So since angle AXB and angle CYD are right angles, they are congruent because they measure 90 degrees. Next, vertical angles are congruent. When we say vertical angles, we will have two intersecting lines. And then, this angle, angle ABC, is congruent to angle FBD because they are vertical angles. Also, this angle, angle ABD, congruent to this angle, angle F, B, C. So, because they are vertical angles. If two parallel lines cut by a transversal, then the alternate interior and alternate exterior angles are congruent. So, using the same example, we have line M is parallel to line N cut by a transversal line P. We have eight angles. We need to get the alternate interior. When we say alternate, they belong on the different side of the figure and then interior meaning inside. So we have angle 3 is congruent to angle 5. 
And angle 4 is congruent to angle 6 because they are alternate interior angles. For the alternate exterior angles, so for the exterior, they have different position in the figure or different side. And then they are at the exterior, outside. So we have angle 1 is congruent to angle 7 and angle 2 is congruent to angle 8. Next theorem, if two parallel lines cut by a transversal, then the same side interior angles are supplementary. So here they are supplementary. If we add them, we will get 180 degrees. Using the same figure, we need to get the same side interior. Same side meaning they should be on the same side and interior inside. So we will have angle 4 plus angle 5 is equals to 180 degrees and angle 3 plus angle 6 is equals to 180 degrees. For the last theorem, we have if two parallel lines cut by a transversal, then the same side exterior angles are also supplementary. So we need to get the same side exterior angles. They should be at the same side and exterior. So we have angle 1 plus angle 8 is equals to 180 degrees. And angle 2 plus angle 7 is equals to 180 degrees. So these are the terminologies that we will use in dealing with mathematical systems.